Hello everyone, my name is Connor. Welcome to Decades. Today we have travelled north up into Cumbria to see. Oh, is it Cumbria? Is it Yorkshire? It's Yorkshire. Are we in Yorkshire? We must be. I hate Yorkshire. So we're here today at the Ribblehead Viaduct. Part of the Settle and Carlisle line, it has multiple arches. Just to show you how good our on location research is, we're going to count them. One, two, three, four. 21, 22, 23, 24 arches, this viaduct. It is very long. In fact, it is exactly 400 meters long and 32 meters high for good measure. It needs to be that tall, otherwise me and my big head wouldn't fit under it. Also known as the Batty Moss Viaduct, the Ribblehead Viaduct comprises part of the Settle and Carlisle Railway across Batty Moss and the Ribble Valley. It can be found 28 miles northwest of Skipton and 26 miles southeast of Kendall, and slap bang in the middle of nowhere with absolutely zero phone signal. So to remedy you getting lost in this quiet realm of yesteryear, we thought we'd do a video on this viaduct and explore its history, for your enjoyment of course. After all, I am a rail enthusiast. I like trains, don't look too far into that one. Obviously, the big question is, when it comes to viaducts, why do they come to exist? In this instance, it's a quite a simple question to answer. In the 1860s, the Midland Railway proposed the construction of a line between Settle and Carlisle, intended to join from the existing Midland lines between Skipton and Carnforth, and travel all the way to the city of Carlisle. In other words, so far north you're virtually at the Scottish border. The problem was, the terrain between Settle and Carlisle was less than ideal for a railway. With its expansive moorland and harsh hills, Finding a passable route would be a massive, if not impossible, feat. Creating one on the other hand was far more plausible. This means several structures would need to be constructed in order to facilitate a railway passing through this land, comprised of a vast quantity of locally sourced materials, simply too costly to move from afar. What some people don't realise about the Ribblehead Viaducts is during its construction, there's a lot of small temporary settlements built along the line. This being one of them. In front of me is the pit of an old engine shed. The engines here would have been used to build the line. Also, a company in this site is an old brickworks. On these sites, a lot of the resources used to build the railway were actually taken from the land local to the line itself. So this brings us on to the construction. The line would be surveyed by John Sidney Crosley and James Joseph Olper. Subsequently, Crosley would design the major works along the route, including the Ribblehead Viaduct we see before us today. The contract to construct the Settle Junction to Denthead Viaduct section, which included the Ribblehead Viaduct, would be granted to John Ashwell in November of 1869 with an estimated cost of approximately £350,000, with the completion expected by May of 1873. The line was to be 72 miles in length, with work beginning at the southern end. Work on Ribblehead Biodup would begin in July of 1870, however the first stone would not be laid until October. Ashwell would be plagued with financial difficulties, with his contract being cancelled upon a mutual agreement in October of 1871. The Midland Railway would take over. The viaduct would be constructed by a total workforce of roughly 2,300 men. They would occupy temporary camps, often with their families, situated around the site. These camps held the names, and please try not to chuckle, Batty Wife Hole, Sebastopol, and Belgravia. The construction of the Ribblehead Viaduct would gain something of an infamy, 
for the high mortality rate of workers, with over 100 men losing their lives in construction related incidents, outbreaks of diseases such as smallpox, and fighting. As a result, the loss of life was so great the railway had to pay for an expansion of the local cemetery. Initially, the Ribblehead Viaduct was due to only have 18 arches. However, by December of 1872, the design would be altered to include 24, each spanning a length of 45 feet. The last stone in the viaduct would be laid in August of 1874. Only a single track would be laid over the viaduct in September of 1874 and the first train carrying passengers would pass over, pulled by the engine known as Diamond on the 3rd of August 1875. The following year, the viaduct would be open for freight traffic and passenger services between Settle and Carlisle and would become fully open following approval by the Board of Trade. Operations would run smoothly for almost an entire century following, and the viaduct is still in use today, as seen by this train passing overhead. Anyhow, it hasn't gone its entire history without its challenges. The viaduct would come into a state of disrepair by the early 1980s, with repairs undertaken costing roughly £100,000 in order to strengthen the limestone viaduct. The viaduct will be reduced to a single track at this time and a 20 mile per hour speed limit will be imposed on it. So as you can imagine these days it's largely regarded as something of a bottleneck. Also in the 1980s British Rail proposed the idea of closing the line, claiming that it was expensive to maintain and didn't carry enough traffic for it to warrant being open. However, due to protests and public support against this plan, the line remained open. In November of 1988, the Ribblehead Biaduct would finally be granted Grade 2 listed status and the land upon which the remains of its construction camps are located have been recognised as a scheduled monument. Well, this might have been like a little quarry. Major restoration will follow in the early 1990s with improvements being implemented a decade following in which the track was renewed and new drainage will be installed allowing for increased freight traffic providing much needed viability to such an expensive structure. These days, the Settle and Carlisle is one of the three north-south main lines, along with the heavily congested west coast main line and east coast main line, with heavy freight traffic opting to use this route to avoid congestion. Over the years, the viaduct is incredibly popular with steam tours, carrying various famous engines, such as Flying Scotsman, Mallard, and Princess Elizabeth, to name a few. Today, the viaduct stands largely as a monument to those who built it. It stands in all weathers, in the harshness of its surroundings, allowing trains to cut through the otherwise impassable terrain. But most of all, it represents the backbone of the 19th century industry, impressive structures established by severely underpaid workers in less than ideal conditions. It's a reminder of the labors those who came before us and how their hard work gives us the accessibility and ease of modern life. Not to mention we get to gaze upon cool stone things. So that dear viewers brings us to the end of our video. I hope you've enjoyed it. 
So if you have enjoyed this video, like, share, and subscribe. And please slap that notification bell so you never miss one of our videos. If you have a friend who will be interested in watching our content, but doesn't necessarily have the time at the moment, simply choke old Doctor from Doctor Who, take his TARDIS, and go back to the construction of the Rebel Head Viaduct, and abandon them in Batty Wife Hole with nothing but an iPad with all of our content preloaded. You never know, they might die in the construction or become an avid fan of decades. That'll be all. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next one.